The car, I used the vehicle itself to prop myself up on, and I got in my car and drove myself to the emergency room. The hospital is only 15 minutes away, but Greg isn't sure if he can make it there. I had no feeling in my legs, and I didn't know if I was applying too much pressure or too little pressure to the brake, and I almost rear-ended someone. I was asking myself what in the world was going on. I didn't know if I was going to make it to the ER. When I got to the hospital, they put me on a gurney and they took me straight to the ICU. People were everywhere. They were taking blood samples. They hooked me up to intravenous pain medications and called my parents. When I first saw Greg, it was um, very emotional. He was in a lot of pain. I reached over and put some cover on his legs, and he screamed. Just the sheet touching him hurt him so bad. The pain was more intense now. It was like my legs were on fire, but it was a continual pain. It terrified me. The ER doctors immediately suspect he has a neurological problem because I became immobilized in such a short period of time. And because of the numbing sensation, the neurologist thought I had on beret guillain barre syndrome is a rare autoimmune disorder affecting the nerves outside the brain and spinal cord. If left untreated, guillain barre can result in full body paralysis and even death. The thought that I could be possibly paralyzed was terrifying. In order to be able to make the determination if it was guillain barre the doctor had to perform a lumbar puncture to check the fluid within my spinal cord. But even as the lab technicians are testing his spinal fluid, Greg's condition seems to be deteriorating by the minute. It kept spreading. At this point, the pain and the numbness was from my waist down to my feet. The pain medications they had me on weren't doing anything. Each hour, it seemed like his legs progressed worse. I was asking myself, was he going to be able to walk again? Was this something that was life-threatening? Three hours later, the doctor returns with the results of the spinal fluid and blood tests, which show absolutely nothing out of the ordinary. I was terrified to know that the doctors had no clue what was going on. They were back to square one. Then, just six hours after being admitted to the ICU, Greg is struck by a frightening new symptom. Greg was laying there and he kept moving his legs. And I said, Greg, what are you doing? And he said, I can't keep my legs still. My legs started to shake on their own and I couldn't control it. It looked like Greg was being electrocuted. It had gotten to the point that Ernest and I did not know what to expect the next hour. Uh, at this point, the doctors wanted to do an MRI on my spinal cord in my brain so they could rule out multiple sclerosis because the pain and the shaking is a symptom of multiple sclerosis. Greg is immediately taken for an emergency MRI. Over the next two hours, doctors meticulously examine the images for any abnormalities. But they are left totally empty-handed. Asked doctors what the next step was. Uh, nobody tell me what was going on. I was beginning to feel hopeless. I didn't know whether I would wake up the next day. I felt useless because I could not help him. I could not take his pain away. And I couldn't get him out of the bed. I just had to sit there and watch Greg suffer. And the next morning, to the family's horror, the mysterious disease begins affecting yet another part of Greg's body. The pain and numbness spread to my right hand. And I thought it was gonna take over my whole body. 
I just didn't know how to handle it anymore. I was at the point that I thought I could lose my son. When I told the doctor that the pain had spread to my hand, they still had no clue what was going on. The doctor said that if it spread and continued moving, that I could be possibly put on a respirator. I would lose the ability to breathe on my own. Terrified that their son is slipping away before their eyes, Greg's parents decide that they can no longer trust the medical team. I was afraid my son was going to die in that hospital. I demanded that Greg be transferred to another hospital. After my dad talked to the doctor, the doctor came back and told me that they were going to send me to Candler Hospital in Savannah, Georgia. With his pain and numbness still spreading by the hour, Greg is loaded into an ambulance for the 100-mile trip to Savannah. By noon, Greg is being rushed into the ICU at Candler Hospital, where neurologist Dr. Julia Michael takes over his case. It was clear that the situation was urgent. I was afraid this pain and weakness would creep up to his neck and paralyze him because this implies uh, a progressive situation that's moving very rapidly. Dr. Michael seemed to be asking questions that the other doctors didn't ask, and she wanted to figure out what was wrong. So Dr. Michael performed a neurological exam, and she checked my reflexes and his sensation on my legs. When I tapped his knees, his leg would jump and jerk and shake uncontrollably. This was clearly abnormal. And he had what we call Babinski signs. When we stroke the bottom of the foot, the toe goes up. The abnormal reflexes suggested there was some involvement of the spinal cord. When I did the sensory exam, every time I stuck his leg with a pin, it caused severe pain. He was so super sensitive. I had seen this constellation of symptoms in a patient before, so I had a hunch uh, about what this might be. Just 72 hours ago, Greg Sapp ran five miles. But now, a mysterious disease has stopped him dead in his tracks. Almost every part of his body is numb. Making matters worse, he's in agonizing pain, and doctors have no idea why. Now, Greg is in the hands of neurologist Dr. Julia Michael, who thinks she might know what's causing the incapacitating symptoms. When I reviewed the spinal fluid information, it showed Greg had a white blood cell count of 25. Normal is less than five, which did suggest that the spinal cord was inflamed. Based on Greg's examination and the spinal fluid, it was my conclusion that Greg was suffering from transverse myelitis. Transverse myelitis is a rare neurological disorder. In healthy individuals, myelin, a fatty substance, insulates the nerve fibers in the spinal cord, allowing them to transmit messages from the brain to the rest of the body. But in patients like Greg, white blood cells go haywire, destroying the myelin and causing inflammation and damage to the nerves. Transverse myelitis is often triggered by a virus that attacks the body. White blood cells trying to ward off the virus think they're attacking an enemy, and somehow the spinal cord cells look like the enemy viral cells. When the spinal cord is impaired, the body is not going to be functioning normally. I was relieved that she was able to come up with a diagnosis, but at the same time, I was confused. I wanted to know more. Greg first experienced a numbness, but as the disease got worse and worse, he developed pain because of damage to part of the spinal cord that controls sensation and pain. His legs were weak and would shake uncontrollably, which told me that the part of the spinal cord that controls uh, motor function or muscle function were involved. However, Dr. Michael can't explain why Greg got transverse myelitis in the first place. When Greg came to us, it was apparent that the virus had been wiped out by the immune system, but the immune system had gotten carried away and was attacking the spinal cord. We don't know why that a patient with transverse myelitis, particularly a very young person, seems to have it spontaneously. 
One thing is clear. Greg's lucky his father insisted on having him transferred. If the disease had continued progressing, it could have been fatal. Patients who aren't moving their legs are very vulnerable to getting clots in their legs. Those clots can travel from the veins up to the lungs and kill you. I was very grateful that Dr. Michael was able to figure out what other doctors weren't able to. I wanted to know how long would it take for me to be cured. Transverse myelitis does not have a cure, but it can be treated. We started Greg on steroids because with the steroids, we could block that immune system and calm the whole spinal cord down. But the effects of transverse myelitis can be permanent. It was really unclear what his future held. It was terrifying because I didn't know whether or not I would be able to walk again. We all just sat on the bed and cried. But Greg's a fighter. I said, it's just a battle we're going to have to fight. And he said, I'm, I'm not going to give in to it. And I am going to fight it. Two weeks later, with his immune system under control, Greg is discharged. But now he must begin the process of getting his muscles back in shape through long and often challenging physical rehabilitation sessions. Moving my legs was very painful. I was still not able to stand up. The pain and the numbness started to dissipate about two months after I got out of the hospital. Three months after being discharged was when I took my first steps. I came home one day from work, and Greg said, look, I can do it. I can't go very far, but I can walk. It was just a very joyous moment. Now back on his feet, Greg begins learning more about his disease and is surprised to discover how rare transverse myelitis is. There are only about 1,400 cases diagnosed in the United States every year. But he still can't help but wonder why the doctors in the first hospital didn't recognize the symptoms. Transverse myelitis is difficult to diagnose because it can look like Guillain-Barre syndrome and it can look like multiple sclerosis. And also, sometimes you can actually see the area of damage on the MRI. In Greg's case, we saw nothing abnormal in the MRIs. Today, two years since his harrowing ordeal, Greg is still recovering and getting better every day. Greg has made a lot of progress from when he left our hospital to where he is now. He could barely walk. He was plagued by pain. And now he walks with a cane. He's making the most of it. And while the disease continues to take a toll on him, he's hopeful about the future. I still suffer from numbness and pain in my right thigh, and I take medications to help with the pain. And even though I'm not able to run like I used to, I'm able to walk, and that's a big step. Greg is even getting back into competitive racing. Currently, I'm training for competition in the Marine Corps Marathon in Washington, D.C. I'm using a hand cycle where I use my arm strength to pedal the bike. Greg is just ecstatic. He said, I can't go run on my legs, but I can still enter marathons on this bicycle. Greg had a determination and a goal to reach for something, and he's reaching it. Greg is my hero. I'm very proud of what he's accomplished. Currently, I'm pursuing a degree in psychology. I want to help veterans who suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. My advice to help other people that have the same problems is to keep your head up. Two years ago, I never would have thought that I would be able to compete in a marathon. I had to put a lot of effort to be able to get to where I am now. Just never give up.